Good afternoon. My name is Nihar Nayak, and these are my teammates, Nihar Garamse, Mike Boyle, Simon Healy, and Andrew Stanley. And we're here today to talk to you about our senior design project. Now, the idea behind our senior design project came from a group of clinician educators at the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia. These doctors and nurses were dissatisfied with the current state of CPR mannequins and the current field of CPR mannequins. Now, if you think about what a CPR mannequin is and what purpose it serves, it needs to provide an accurate reenactment of the human chest. When I push down on a mannequin, I need it to feel like it would feel if I were pushing down on a real human being. Now, after meeting with these clinician educators and discovering that CPR mannequins were not meeting current needs, we came up with our project goal which was to develop and build a high fidelity CPR mannequin that would allow us to accurately reenact the feeling of a human chest. In addition, we wanted to provide a feedback tool to our users so that they would know whether they were performing CPR in the correct way. So what does CPR feel like? Well, using a device called a puck, which Mike will now display, we can map out a force displacement curve. The puck contains both an accelerometer and a force sensor that allows us to break down the CPR cycle into two phases. First, there's the compression phase, which as you can see is relatively linear, followed by the rebound phase, which displays a lot of hysteresis due to the viscoelastic nature of the human chest. Now if we look at current CPR mannequins and what they're able to do, we see that the spring inside allows them to model the compression phase very well. However, due to the linearity of the spring inside, when we now come back and look at the rebound phase, we see that they follow the same path on the force displacement curve. Now, our goal in creating our CPR mannequin was to follow the, using was to use a spring and follow the compression <coughs> phase as well. However, we also wanted to add in extra features that would allow us to incorporate the necessary hysteresis. So, breaking down kind of the compression phase and rebound phase, and looking at free body diagrams of each. We can see that in compression, there are only two major forces that act. First, the human pushing down on the mannequin, and the spring force of the body pushing back up. However, what we discovered through modeling was that in the rebound phase, there's an additional force at play, specifically the damping force that provides the hysteresis that we were looking to add. To create our dynamic model of the human chest, we analyzed data provided to us by our sponsor at the Children's Hospital in Philadelphia. This data was collected using that same puck tool by a doctor administering real chest compressions on a 21-year-old male patient. This data provides both force versus time and displacement versus time data for the human chest. We had about 60 compressions worth of data to analyze, and we have three compressions worth of our force versus time data shown here. So we look at all 60 compressions and look at an average stiffness of the human chest for all these compressions, and it came out to about 8,100 newtons per meter which we can simulate with a spring. The red line here, by plugging that spring force deflection curve into the, the displacement data, you can see that it follows pretty linearly on the increasing force during the compression, but on the decreasing force during the rebound, there's a pretty large amount of error, which we have mapped out as that vertical displacement uh, as the force error on the lower curve. So what we wanted in our model was to include that damping force on the rebound. Uh, we did a least worst fit over all 60 compressions worth of the data, and you can see that by inc including this damping force on the rebound, the data fits much better, and the force error is well below the 50 to 60 newtons shown here, closer to 10 or so. So now that we had an act what we felt was an accurate model of the human chest, we needed to figure out how could we recreate these forces in our mannequin. The easiest way to get a controlled force is probably through an electromechanical actuator, such as a DC motor or a solenoid. However, for the magnitude of forces needed for CPR, which as you can see is over 250 newtons, you would need a very large motor or solenoid, which would not fit in a CPR mannequin. The other option would be to gear down this motor to increase the force output, but pressing through a set of gears would not feel much like a human chest. So what we ultimately ended up building, uh, we, started, we kept the spring underneath where the user will push to provide the majority of the force. We then used a push-pull cable connected at the, under, at the chest plate underneath the, where the human will be pushing. It runs down through the center of the spring, along the side of the mannequin, down to the bottom of the mannequin. This push-pull cable allows us to convert the vertical motion of the compressions into a horizontal motion along the bottom of the mannequin. We can measure this uh, displacement with a potentiometer, which is an analog sensor that allows us to see at any point in time where in the compression cycle the user is. This 
push-pull cable also allows us to convert the vertical motion of the chest compressions into horizontal motion of the air pots. In the air pots, a graphite piston moves back and forth with the compression motion, pushing a volume of air into and out of the mannequin. The air flows out of the air pots along these tubes into a manifold, where we measure the pressure with a pressure transducer. This provides us with our estimate of how much damping force we're getting out of the dash pots. The air then flows out through a programmable valve where we can adjust the orifice by changing the voltage that we send to the valve. We change this voltage with a microcontroller located at the top of the mannequin. Finally, a force sensing resistor on the top of the chest plate is more for user feedback. This allows the user to see whether they're fully releasing between each compression, which is a major part of the American Heart Association guidelines. So one of the biggest challenges of using air as an actuator is that air is compressible. So you can imagine that during the compression, we have the valve pretty far open, so you're not getting too much damping force. But on the rebound, as you start constricting the flow of the air, you get not only that air constriction, which we model by a valve constant alpha times the difference in pressure inside and outside of the dash pots, but you also get a stretching of the air as you start to pull a vacuum. This force, total force out from the dash pots is going to be equal to the difference in pressure between the ambient pressure and the force inside the dash pots times the combined cross-sectional area of all the dash pots. We start with the ideal gas law, differentiate both sides to get a dynamic relationship, and then solve for alpha. This basically gives us at any point in time our best guess of how far we need to open the valve to get the damping force that we need based on the current force, the desired force, the position and velocity of the pistons. We can rearrange this equation to get our plant dynamics, which allows us to run some simulations on our system. Here we have a block diagram of the control architecture that we're implementing on our microcontroller. We start with the input of the position from the potentiometer. We differentiate this to get velocity and plug it into our model of the human chest that we mentioned earlier to get the desired damping force at any point in time during the cycle. We run this desired force through our feed forward term, which from the previous slide was the equation that we solved for alpha, basically saying how much we think we should open the valve at any point in time to get that desired damping force. We then run this through our actuator limitations, which is basically saying you can only open the valve so far or close it so far. So even if it's completely open, you'll still get some constriction. And even if it's completely closed, you'll still get a little bit of leakage. Next, we simulate some calibration error and finally run it back through our plant dynamics to get the force output. Because this output force will probably not match up perfectly with the desired force, we then run the difference in these forces through our feedback compensator, where we use PD control to improve the tracking. Finally, the output is the force that the user feels. So all this com computer modeling is great, but how does, the, how does the mannequin actually perform in the real world? So what we did is we uh, performed a few tests uh, using the puck that Nihar mentioned earlier. Um, and what we have here is in the top left, or on the left, we have data that was collected from uh, an actual patient during a real CPR session. And we can see the hysteresis that Nihar described in the force displacement curve. Uh, on the right, we have uh, a test that we performed, again, using the puck. And this was performed on a simple mannequin with just a spring inside. So as we would expect, the force displacement curve is linear because it's a linear spring. Uh, we then tested it on our own mannequin with the damping, and we can see that we actually got that hysteresis that we were looking for. So in that case, the quantitative, the quantitative performance, we thought, matched up fairly well. Uh, but quantitative feedback, is, quantitative feedback is nice, but we also need to know how does it actually feel to someone who's using it. So to do this, we took uh, our mannequin over to the children's hospital, and we had some doctors actually compress, uh, do some real chest compressions, and see it give us feedback on how they thought it went. Uh, from what we can see here from this quote, uh, we actually got some positive feedback, and since our last presentation, we've actually been back to the hospital, and more doctors have compressed on it, um, and have given us more encouraging feedback. So in that case, we were happy with the performance. Uh, so in addition to just the feel of the human chest, we wanted to make this uh, valuable training tool for anyone who wants to learn how to do CPR. So to do this, we built a graphical user interface that's shown here, um, and it can in real time show a number of variables as you continue, as you do the compressions. So in the top left, we have the position versus time. Uh, in the top right, it's the pressure versus time. Bottom left is the valve voltage. And the bottom right is that force sensing resistor that Andrew mentioned. Uh, so right now we're gonna do a live demo. Uh, Mike's gonna do some compressions. And, okay, so you can see that as Mike compresses in the top left, this is the position versus time. So as he goes down, you can see that the graph tracks in real time um, and you can see how far you're going down. 
Uh, and the top right, again, is the pressure that's inside the pressure transducer, transducer that Andrew mentioned. Um, in the bottom left, this is the voltage going to the valve. And you can see that during the compression, the voltage changes based on how Mike is doing his compressions. So that's using the control scheme that Andrew talked about. Um, and then in the bottom right, we have the force the for sensing resistor, which is on the top. Um, and as you can see, as you let go, it either goes up or down. Um, and then so what we can do, we can hit stop, um, and then analyze the data. And basically what this does, this outputs a number of histograms that show whether or not you fall within the guidelines set out by the American Heart Association. So in the top right, uh, the guidelines specify that you're supposed to go at a specific speed to a specific depth, and you're also supposed to release in between each compression. Uh, red bars indicate that you did not fall within the guidelines, while green bars indicate that you did. So obviously you might have a little bit of work to do. <laughs> That's okay. Um, so going back to our presentation. Um, so this was data from actual doctors. So you can see that they're a little bit better than Mike, but as we would expect. Um, so in conclusion, uh, we'd like to thank our advisor, Dr. Kuchenbecker. Um, and our sponsor, Matt Maltese from the Children's Hospital of Philadelphia, and the following people. Uh, we really couldn't have done it without you guys, and we really appreciate everything you've done for us. Um, so right now, we'd like to open the floor up for questions, if anyone has any questions. <laughs>